Good evening, and thank you for joining us at Live from NYPL. My name is Tony Marks, and I'm the president of the New York Public Library, and it's my honor and privilege to welcome you to this great live event. We're so pleased to be joined tonight by Ronald Daniels, the author of the recent book, What Universities Owe Democracy. Ron has served as the 14th president of Johns Hopkins University since 2009. There he has, amongst so much else, strengthened interdisciplinary research, enhanced student access, deepened the university's engagement with the city of Baltimore, and increased all of our engagements uh, on campus and, uh, and will be across the nation uh, on the civic issues of the day through the Agora Institute, which has been founded at Hopkins uh, together with the support of the Nearcos Foundation, our friends there. So it all comes full circle and we couldn't be more delighted to host uh, this event and look forward to more Agora events uh, here at the library coming uh, as we uh, as we move ahead. Um, so uh, Ron will be joined tonight by Anthony Appiah, professor of philosophy and law at NYU and also of course the New York Times Magazine's resident ethicist and the author most recently, The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity. Thanks, huge thanks to both Ron and Anthony. Um, I've known Ron for a long time. Uh, um, we've been brethren together as uh, college university presidents. And in that, of course, Ron has always uh, stood out as a national leader, not just because Johns Hopkins is such an amazing university doing such crucial work in the pandemic and beyond, um, but for what Ron has done with Hopkins, uh, through Hopkins, uh, in terms of the issues that he highlights in his book as so essential that we need our universities to feed social mobility in this country as they were designed to do. They are crucial for building a sense of civic engagement, civic understanding and education so that we can all be uh, better citizens in this uh, fraught time, uh, as well as making sure that there's an understanding uh, that truth exists, that it can be, must be sought, that it can be found, and standing up for that principle, which seems like it shouldn't be under threat, but we all know is at this point. And of course, the cultivation of pluralistic and diverse communities um, that make for better education for everyone, because we know that we all learn from each other, we have different experiences, and we have to gather in that way um, if we're going to hold ourselves together, which the country seems to be having trouble doing at this point. Look, the truth is our great universities serve all of these important functions and they have also faltered in serving all those functions, like all institutions. Um, you know, in this day of pizzazz, it's always tempting for brand to overtake substance. Uh, in, in the decisions that we make and the, the, the course that we set for institutions, universities. That temptation is real and resisting it is hard. And it comes down to values. It comes down to leadership. And at Hopkins and for the United States at this juncture for higher education, uh, we look to Ron Daniels um, for helping us think through these issues and providing us with that leadership. We couldn't be more delighted to host this timely event. And again, huge thanks. Before we get started, um, a few housekeeping items. If you have a question for Ron, we, he'd be glad to answer them. Please send uh, them at any time using the chat function here, Google form or by emailing public programs, one word, all lowercase, public programs, plural, at nypl.org. The library values your privacy. So we want you to know that even though the video and the chat you're on, uh, on an nypl.org page are hosted by YouTube. By participating in the chat, you might share data about yourself, which the library cannot and does not control, YouTube controls. For more details, you can visit the event page. Real-time captions are available for tonight's program. You can click on the closed caption button or access a live transcript via the stream text link shared in the chat. Now, please welcome 
my friends, Anthony Appiah and Ron Dennis. Uh, well, <laughs> hello, Ron, and um, uh, thank you, Tony. Um, well, when we start talking about books, we usually want to say something, a little bit of something about who's, who's written them, who the author is. Authors are people, and we like to feel we know the people that we're reading. So let me just ask you just a few questions about your background before we turn to the subject of the book. You, you grew up in, in Canada, in, in Toronto, I think. That's correct. Um, but your family uh, has its origins elsewhere. Yeah, so uh, it's a story that I referred to at the front end of the book, but that is that uh, my father came to Canada from Poland in March 1939, just on the eve of the Second World War, and at a moment where if he had stayed behind in Europe, he almost certainly would have been swept up in the Holocaust that affected six million European Jews. So, um, you know, for me growing up, that sense of the narrow miss that my father had uh, with totalitarianism and with anti-Semitism, um, uh, with fascism was very much um, an important part of the context in which I understood the world and, of course, the importance of liberal democracy. And, and so, you, so you too um, went to went to college in, in Toronto and you, uh, your first job was, your, the first uh, leadership job was there. That's correct. So did my undergraduate, uh, did my undergraduate degree, my law degree at Toronto, spent some time um, uh, doing um, graduate work at Yale uh, Law School, but then came back and joined the University of Toronto. And um, ultimately, as a, after a period of years as a faculty member, became dean of law school for a decade. Do you think that uh, being a law school dean is a good preparation for being a university leader more generally, or are lawyers particularly either easy or difficult to manage? <laughs> I think it's great training. Uh, the hurly <laughs> burly world, as you know, Anthony, of a law school is is a very challenging and and wonderfully rich place to be in the university, in particular because law is so deeply connected to so many different other disciplines in the university. It's just an exciting focal point for intellectual inquiry. So I love being, uh, I love being at a law school. And ironically, I'm now at a university, of course, without a law school. Without a law school. Um, but you got there by way of, uh, by way of your first, uh, by, by way of other jobs in America. So at some point you, you became a different kind of North American. Um, and, and, your first big sort of uh, leadership job in the United States was at um, yeah, uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. Where, I was, where I was provost for right. uh, four years. Right. Um, and there you moved away from managing a law school to, move to managing a whole university, uh, which, uh, like Hopkins, where you are now, um, among other things, has, has a, a large and influential and famous medical school in so you must have begun the business of learning how to manage that, which is a very different set of challenges from uh, managing a, a group of lawyers, for one thing, because you have to run a hospital. Indeed. You know, it's one of these uh, funny realizations that you make, Anthony, that um, when I was at Toronto, uh, I oversaw a law school with about 500 students and about 50 faculty members. And because it was so... Um, incredibly interdisciplinary uh, in its orientation. We uh, had philosophers, economists, um, historians, you know, working cheek by jowl with one another. I thought I really understood the university until I <laughs> got to got to the states and realized um, the complexities and challenges of of the, of academic medicine. And indeed, you know, in truth, one of the things that's great about having my job is the ability to see so many different ways in which intellectual inquiry in which education is supported throughout the university, but very different incentives, very different cultural norms. There are, of course, bedrock cultural norms that shape the entire university, but there are things that um, are truly unique to particular disciplines, divisions, and that's the magic of being in my job is the ability to see these things and understand how you can support the kind of flourishing that um, is so vital for the success of universities. 
So the focus of your book, which is, by the way, a lovely discussion in, in it of many of these uh, features of universities and the ways they work, but, but the focus of your book is on the relationship between the university and democracy. And um, one thing that you might, well, one thing you argue uh, is that democracy of the sort that we value, and I want you to say a little bit about your understanding of what it is about democracy of the sort that we have that you value, but that it does seem to be globally under threat. You point out that there's fewer countries are democratic in the way you care about uh, now than were um, in the past, uh, in the recent past, that there's been a, a democratic recession. That, uh, but what is it about, um, uh, t t tell me a little bit about your understanding of, of, of our political system in terms of what, it, what, is it, what does it mean that we're a liberal democracy and how does that relate to the life of the university? So, Anthony, as, as you know, um, although we use a short, shorthand term democracy um, in, um, in, in, in describing uh, the political environment that we're in in the United States, the truth is that we're in a liberal democracy. And of course, liberal does not in this context mean progressive. It means something else. And so the idea for liberal democracy is twofold. One is the democracy component of the definition is of course about popular sovereignty and the idea that the leaders of a country or the political unit we're talking about are ultimately accountable to the, uh, to the citizenry. And that's an important idea. And the way typically we determine how governments are elected is by way of majoritarian will. The idea that the, uh, that those who are elected as our representatives regularly have to go back and have their leadership affirmed uh, by the public is the democratic part of this idea of liberal democracy. But we don't say um, in thinking about liberal democracies, and again, describing the United States or my home country, Canada, we don't say that popular will is, uh, operates without constraint. We put limitations on how that will is expressed. And there are some things that even if a majority of citizens want to move in a certain direction, we still say there are limitations here. And here, typically, this is the idea of liberalism and tied to ideas of personal freedom and individual autonomy, that the state can't trench on core inalienable rights, uh, the right of political um, expression, uh, the uh, right to be protected from unlawful or arbitrary imprisonment. One could go on and on. And these rights, of course, are particularly germane for minority members of our community. So it is this idea of liberalism and democracy that we put together that is such an important framing idea for the structures, the norms, the values of our country. And it's it, there are ideas that don't always perfectly align with one another. There are sometimes tensions between these two components, but by and large, we've done a remarkable job on reconciling the liberalism and the democracy components of the idea in this country. And indeed, when one looks at the level of personal freedom, of equality that are achieved, if one looks at the uh, life expectancy, the economic productivity, um, on so many different dimensions of individual welfare, this structure of government is remarkably powerful. And it's, it's, it's an idea of how we govern ourselves that um, is worth fighting for and protecting. And particularly in a moment where, as you described uh, um, earlier, uh, that we're seeing more countries backsliding into authoritarian forms of government where they, uh, um, appear to be shedding their commitment to uh, to this ideal of liberal democracy. Uh, some by being um, less, having less popular sovereignty and some by being less liberal. Exactly. Um, but in the United States, universities began, colleges began, of course, at a time, I and mean, they were very much a minority enterprise. Uh, and even if they were in some sense connected with democracy, from the beginning, and we can we can ask about that. Um, they were very much, as I say, a minority enterprise. Not many people went to college in the 18th century uh, anywhere in the world, and in, in, and in particular, not many went to college. At, at this. So, so if these uh, in, if these institutions, which began 
in the 18th century um, to become connected with democracy as, as democracy develops in the country and we get the constitutional liberalism of the Bill of Rights. Um, how do you think, uh, how can we see uh, universities and colleges figuring into the popular rule part of things, given that they start out at, at least uh, as a sort of minority enterprise, uh, mostly uh, occupying uh, the children of, you know, elite, uh, the, the male children of the elite. So it's a terrific question, Anthony, and and it is a remarkable and really stirring history, which um, I really um, enjoyed being able to explore and develop within the book, and particularly as a foreigner coming to the United States and in awe uh, before I got here of the strength of the system, but really not understanding the historical context for how we got the institutions that we have generated in this country, which, again, um, truly inspire um, people throughout the world. I mean, these are these are amazing and extraordinary institutions that we created. But as you've said, it didn't start off that way. Indeed, you know, although I argue in the book that uh, universities are a bedrock, are a bulwark institution for contemporary liberal democracy, I tend to think of these institutions the way one would typically think about the role that an independent judiciary play or the role that uh, a really vigorous and responsible media play in holding power to account. So these are core institutions that are um, implicated in the enterprise of building a vigorous liberal democracy. Universities didn't, didn't start off that way, as, as, as you know. Um, despite the fact that if you look back to the founders of the country and even, you know, George Washington's uh, early uh, uh, speeches, there was a clear recognition that these, even these institutions, which as you say, were uh, privileged enclaves, by no means representative, these were not sites of mass education, um, but nevertheless, the founders, several of the founders really understood how important these institutions ultimately would be for the success of American democracy. And in fact, even George Washington called for the creation of a national university as another critical institution to guarantee the success of American democracy. And over time, um, much like American democracy itself, we've seen this remarkable evolution, um, the Morrill Acts and the extent to which uh, in the Civil War period, we see um, the investment by the federal government and ultimately by states in creating public institutions that just, have- just, just remind people what the Morrill Act uh, is. So essentially uh, the Morrill Acts created, two Morrill Acts created, um, these are land grant institutions, but essentially gave resources, gave federal lands to state institutions, public institutions that would play a role in, in essentially offering the promise to higher education to uh, American uh, citizens on a scale that was really unimaginable before this took place. Um, and so through the Morrill Acts in the 19th century, through again, the decisions that were made in the, um, in the um, period just after the Second World War with the GI Bill, which again created federal financial aid to give um, access to returning veterans to be able to, uh, to uh, secure the privileges of, of university education. And on through the 60s, we've just seen the emergence of these institutions, which are so different than the ones which, which were originally created in this country, and seen them assume major responsibilities for research, for education, and for being sites uh, where uh, we're able to speak truth to power, and as a consequence, have become very important instruments uh, sites for supporting liberal democracy in the way that Tony Marks in his introduction described everything from social mobility to educating for democracy to checking facts um, and, and doing our best to confirm tr the truth or not of certain claims. Um, these, for all these reasons, we've just become really important institutions for the success of our democratic experiment. So we've got... Um a very complex system now uh, because we have the great private research universities like Hopkins, like, like Johns Hopkins. 
um, or a lot like NYU where I teach, we've got a very powerful, large, successful public sector, University of California, University of Wisconsin, and so on. Um, uh, the uh, New York State runs a powerful set of universities, uh, as does the city. And then we've got many, many two-year colleges, which are uh, one of the points of entry to, to higher education for people who may go on to do four-year degrees, but they start out uh, doing their degrees in the... Now, you've, you've spent your life at the top end of the system in terms of, in terms of prestige uh, and, and resources. Um, and, and, and we're going to talk mostly about that, but I just wanted to, to just at this point to, to point out that it is a system and that presumably much of what you say, even though it's focused on dealing with the issues as they face an elite private institution, many of these issues are going to be important uh, throughout the whole system. So we're not in, in focusing on, on Hopkins and what you've learned from Hopkins and, and, and University of Pennsylvania, uh, we're, not, we're not ignoring the fact that we're in a large system and that it's the whole system uh, matters a great deal. And nor are we ignoring the fact that I think only about 40% of uh, 18 to 25 year olds are in tertiary education at all. And so a, a significant part of the population is going to have to uh, learn to meet its role in, in the democracy without, without the direct help of colleges. Though, of course, the people who teach them in high schools will presumably be trained in colleges and, and so on. So having said that, having sort of focused us down a little bit, um, Let's, let's talk about the connection between universities and, and, and a very important issue in, in democracies, which is a certain kind of, inequal, uh, a certain kind of equality. The, the, whatever uh, inequality persists in all societies and it persists in democracies, but democracies are nevertheless committed to a certain vision of social equality and political equality and so on. And we're a very unequal society. We're more unequal now economically than we were you know, 20 years ago. We've become more unequal economically. And that has a big impact on lots of things. One of the things it has a big impact on is um, the fact that there are plenty of people who, don't, who are not doing very well economically. And they're often living in neighborhoods where the schools aren't, the, the high schools and the, and the secondary, the middle schools and so on, the elementary schools are not properly funded uh, or not funded as, as one might like. And so, and they don't have the resources to fill in the gap so that the, 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 the cohorts that arrive at a place like Hopkins come from a very unequal society and they've had very unequal amounts of investment in them, in their education. And so there's a problem of balancing uh, a concern for fairness, which are those egalitarian ideas might need you to worry about, with, with, a rec and the, rec with the recognition that these people have had very different resources invested in them. And this means that our talk of meritocracy can be a little bit conflicted, I think, because on the one hand, we want a system that's, that rewards the people with the talent who've made the effort. And on the other hand, we know that all the measures we have of who's going to succeed are very much shaped by things which don't have much to do with talent and effort and have a lot to do with whether you came from a rich or a poor background. So how do you, how do you think about these things when you're trying to think about what is it for an, an elite university like yours, one that's one that's at the top end of the system, what is it for that to have a system of access that's consistent with the democratic impulse towards equality? So um, it's a it's a really important question, Anthony, and it's and it's one that, um, in truth, uh, universities like ours have struggled with for decades, um, and so. Let, let's let's go back to sort of foundational principles. Um, at at core for me, um, and it's a point that I make at several points in the book, as you know, I do believe strongly in the merit principle. I do believe that there is something powerful about the idea that you identify people who have the intellectual gifts, who have the aspiration, who have the creativity, who have the dis discipline, and that you bring them to institutions where they can achieve amazing things. And, you know, again, as given the job that I have, I'm constantly in awe of the magic of universities and their ability to give um, flight to the to human achievement 
that is that that is truly inspiring. Um, and and so the idea that 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 you want to bring people who have the greatest uh, talent, capability, commitment to your institution, both at the level of our student body and our faculty, I think is an important idea. I think where it runs into problems and where there is criticism of the merit principle is when you get into the issue of how do you define merit? How do you demonstrate merit uh, worthiness, deservedness to be members of, a, of an institution like, like Hopkins, for instance. And here, I th if one looks at the, you know, the span of, of, of history, you can see a number of times in which our institutions were um, indifferent to the demonstration of merit by a lot of groups that um, clearly deserved a place in our institution. So the role of women, um, and we know that the traditional exclusion of women for, uh, for uh, almost a century from institutions like Hopkins, uh, the challenges facing ethnic and racial minorities, again, facing significant barriers just by virtue of your affiliation with, with a minority group, made you less attractive um, for admission to these institutions. And we've known as well, and it goes to the point you know, that you just raised a moment ago, that people from uh, um, lower socioeconomic backgrounds also face immense challenges in, in coming to our institutions. But here's a significant part of the story, um, the important through line, is as we have gotten I think more attentive to this principle of deservedness, to merit, we have become much more adroit at being able to find people, to find, find them in places where normally we didn't look in the past, to find pathways into our institutions to provide levels of financial support of other types of support so they can excel in our programs. So, you know, the, we, we don't talk as much these days about where are the women in universities? Indeed, we're now having the opposite conversation about where are the men to the extent that we've seen um, in a number of institutions more women enrolling than men. Um, we've, you know, I would say over the last several years, something that we never tracked before, but now we're tracking and we're getting bragging rights of, um, that come from our success in recruiting students who are so-called Pell eligible, meaning that they're from uh, the bottom three income quintiles in this country. And again, seeing that there's real virtue of demonstrating the commitment to merit and to equal opportunity in this country by bringing those people in. So it is true that, um, that there's so many things that will separate uh, students from one another, students from privilege from students who don't have that privilege. It's not just education, it's stability of families. It's a neighborhood you grow up in. It's a level of, of stimulation you've received. Uh, you know, there's just so many factors, but despite all of that, we've gotten much better at finding students um, who may be applying from schools where there's no guidance counselor. They're applying from a remote uh, community and a rural part of the country where they may be, you know, the first of a student to apply to university, um, at least one of the universities on the coast um, in that school's history. And yet we're finding them. And more than that, not only are we finding them and developing more holistic ways of discerning their true capabilities, their deservedness, we're also ensuring that when they're here, that they succeed and putting resources into um, additional support so that it's not just writing a big check, but ensuring that these students get all the uh, support so that they can really flourish in the way students of privilege do in our programs. So it's a long-winded answer, uh, but, it's a, but it's an important issue that we're really tapping into when we, when we discuss this, this idea and the evolution I think of how how we have been more um, uh, attentive to the you know the merit principle and and it's here I'll just say the you know the final piece of this is that I think um, we also um, particularly at a place like Hopkins have become. Uh, more attentive to the ways in which certain kinds of practices, like, for instance, legacy admissions, 
really not at the at the um, at the whole principle of our devotion to merit. Right. So you've uh, you've moved away from legacy admissions completely, um, and you one of your recommendations in the book is that others should do like go do go do likewise, and I imagine that you think that that is going to happen. Uh, eventually, though it will be unpopular, no doubt, with the alumni of many institutions whose names we know. You know, it's, um, you know, for me, it's so interesting, um, you know, particularly coming from Canada, where there is no equivalent uh, practice um, in the in uh, the way in which students are um, recruited, admitted into universities. This is just this is a, a, for for those who have come outside the country seat. This is really a very peculiar and anachronistic practice. And and again, to the extent that um, we are really fighting for the preservation of the um, vitality of liberal democracy. And to the extent, as, as I argue in the book, that we are a bulwark institution for that, it seems hard for me how we can reconcile our belief in merit and our commitment to equal opportunity and to recruiting the best and brightest irrespective of their backgrounds, while at the same time, we are running openly and without apology, a program that puts the thumb on the scale for, uh, for students who in truth have had so many uh, privileges and benefits throughout their life. So um, I, it just seems that on this particular practice, it is, it is so um, egregious that it continues at a time when we're really fighting for um, a very important set of principles and for an institution that I think is absolutely essential for the success of liberal democracy. I suppose, I mean, one way of putting it is to say that um, that legacy uh, preferences simply express uh, an, an unmerit-based idea about access. I mean, uh, whatever, whatever you think dessert is, surely it cannot be the case that uh, dessert in entering a college or a university should be a function of whether your parents went there. That just seems like you know, we can argue about whether one thing or another is an element of merit. Absolutely. But having parents who came here just doesn't seem like a kind of merit at all. We're really out of I, I, we're really out of the merit space on this. I mean, we are no. we are we are talking about some other instrumental set of goals that are being achieved for this practice. But again, if we're if we are going to respond to some of the contemporary criticisms that are out there about universities, and in particular, this sense of inherited privilege that's now achieved through the conferral of uh, access to these programs, then it, it seems to me it really requires um, a fresh look at whether in this day and age, this is a, this is a program of practice that is uh, worthy of being continued. And I am encouraged, uh, Amherst, recently made a decision, uh, Biddy Martin, who's a terrific president, made a decision uh, to stop um, legacy admissions. There are various- There's no, alumni... there's no connection between that and the fact that she's now leaving Hamlet, I suppose. <laughs> it could, it could <laughs> well be a slight co connection there. Uh, but but you know, it, it is interesting even to see uh, the way in which various alumni groups are now uh, coalescing around uh, 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 oh. rethinking this practice, so. All right, so let's let's turn to another set of topics that have to do, uh, you mentioned criticism of the university. Uh, there's criticism of the universities as kind of part of the system of um, the preservation of privilege in our society. And obviously uh, that's, that isn't just done by <laughs> university admissions, it's done by lots of things. Uh, and it's done by, uh, you know, preparation for aptitude tests and all kinds of things. There's a, there's a lot of goes into that and we need, we need to do many things, but it seems, as you said, that this is low hanging fruit, that this is something where we can, we can make a move in the right direction um, in, in a way that's pretty straightforward uh, without having to have many arguments about what are and are, aren't mm -hmm. elements of, of merit. But we have criticized um, 
here's a topic which you raise in your book, which I think is really important, and where perhaps we're not criticized enough, uh, which is the fact that, especially in, in the social sciences, there's been what's sometimes called a crisis of reproducibility. So tell us a little bit about what that problem is as you see it as a president of a great university and what you think we should be doing about it. Well, it goes back to um, where, we, where we were um, earlier in the conversation and, 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 and that is to enumerate the ways in which universities bolster liberal democracy. And one of the ways that I think is really important, as much as we talk about social mobility and educating for democracy and modeling pluralism, these are all important roles for, uh, for institutions like ours. A, a really important way in which we contribute to the uh, performance of democracy is in the way in which we check claims that are made, particularly by those in power, public and private power, and ascertain their validity or not. And, you know, to the extent that people often wonder, you know, how is it that you um, can defend the ideas of tenure and the job protection that that entails? Um, the answer is that, the, that that's an important institution, an important practice that supports our capacity capacity to be fearless in the pursuit of truth. And we say our devotion to reason, the emphasis that we place on facts are all aspects of our institutions that make us well positioned, indeed perhaps uniquely positioned to be able to speak truth to power. So that's a setup for a problem that I think has been neglected, um, but it's a very important in terms of our capacity to continue to enjoy the public confidence uh, in the role that we play around checking truth claims about, uh, about providing fact is um, how we conduct our research. And here for the last several years, there have been a number of different studies that have shown both in the sciences traditional sciences and the social sciences, that results that we publish in journals that are peer reviewed and subject to all the standards of rigorous peer review. But nevertheless, uh, despite publication and prior review, um, there's a percentage, sometimes in some studies as high as 50 to 60% of the results of those studies that cannot be replicated. And that's an important issue because one of the key ways in which we um, are able to demonstrate the truth uh, or the validity of claims we make through particularly experiments is by replication. If you can't replicate an experiment using the same methodology, then that undermines the, the truth claim that you have or the accuracy of the results that you're reporting. And here, I really do think that um, this is an important issue for us to grapple with at the university is how we're going to deal with this reproducibility issue. That if we can't have consistent uh, and high levels of reproducibility, then we undermine the public's confidence in our ability to mediate um, among different claims about certain phenomena, whether, whether this vaccine does or doesn't work, or whether this kind of intervention in public policy will or will not work. We, 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 we must be sensitive to this issue. And it's an issue ultimately, which I think would be very fruitfully addressed by thinking um, about the ways in which we can encourage our faculty to produce more of the data upon which they rely in public space so that just as a number of different media outlets have moved to putting more of their work that they use to justify or support stories that they publish in journals or in um, um, on um, uh, uh, electronic media sites and so forth, that we would adopt the same practices, make it easier for people to see the work that supports these results and also think about other practices that would encourage uh, our faculty to publish even uh, results that are not what they thought they would be, um, where, where hypotheses have not been borne out again, for creating an environment in which we um, reduce the incentives for this kind of publication of non-replicable results. 
So I presume, but much of the, so there are many famous experiments in, in, um, in social psychology, for example, where um, uh, a conclusion has been drawn, but um, it, it, may, it turns out that nobody's actually ever tried to do the experiment twice. It's, it's a really important result. It's cited in all the textbooks, uh, but no one's ever tried to do it again. How does one, I mean, and this is, this, these are, nobody's saying that these people were deliberately um, uh, uh, cheating or fixing things. They didn't, they don't know that their results are, whether their results are reproducible until somebody tries. I'm wondering, I mean, an obvious solution, of course, would be to give more incentives to people to try to reproduce results. Right now you get, you get the big prizes for producing new results, which other people might try to reproduce. But um, I remember somebody once proposing that, that graduate students in, in, say, sociology, that one of the, who do experimental work rather than ethnographic work anyway, uh, or database work, should be encouraged as part of their graduate training to, to try to replicate. There should be a database of, of important results that need replicating. And one of their tasks in graduate school should just be to run through a classic experiment and see if they can, uh, if it works a second time, as it were. I'm, I, so it seems to me that, I mean, so that's a proposal. Uh, it hasn't been taken up, um, but there presumably are other proposals. And I suppose one question, this is one of those places where university leadership can be important because you, you, you've you got to persuade the, the disciplines in the end. But if you can provide resources for doing this sort of thing, if you can provide resources for thinking about reproducibility, um, that may eventually feed back into the disciplines because people will will have the resources to do the work that needs to be done. So I, I, I think that's absolutely right. And so within the book, there's a number of different um, ways in which I think about the incentive problems are created. And of course, you know, our incentives as academics are often to be contrarian, to produce results that are not expected, that are fresh and bracing and open up new pathways to understanding certain phenomena. And that's, that's desirable. It's just the question is, are those results being uh, done responsibly and with the kind of care and attentives that are that is necessary, again, to provide the public assurance that they can be confident in what we are communicating to them about the nature of our research. So I, I think there are things that institutions can do um, much in the way that you've described, whether it's funds for working on replication. Um, there's, uh, um, again, as I indicated a moment ago, the emphasis on having uh, faculty uh, present more of the data and uh, the methodology and uh, that they've used to uh, find certain results and again make that available to others to try and even work with the data see if they can manipulate it and get the same result or a different result um, and I think there's ways in which even we can encourage uh, researchers to share the results of hypotheses that were not borne out where there's at one level may not be glory in that, but it's important in terms of giving direction to others who may be thinking about the same kind of experiment. And, and again, this is a way it, in which science uh, progresses. It's through a process of trial and error and where you have error, it, it should be it should be something that is shared. And again, that contributes to the enhancement of the discipline. Long story short, um, if we take seriously that the university is a key site for where truth is, truth claims, where facts are generated, it's important that we actually have the systems the methodologies in place, and we do have them. It's not that we've been indifferent to this, but that in this moment, we uh, double and redouble our efforts to make sure we're doing this in a manner that as much as possible preserves our legitimacy and capacity to, as I said before, speak truth to power. Okay, that's, uh, let's turn now to the last set of topics that I wanted to ask you about that are in the book. Um, one of the phrases in the book is uh, purposeful pluralism. Now, we've talked about the fact that our institutions have become um, way more diverse uh, recently, that we've, we've managed to go out and find um, talent in places where we didn't look before. And we've uh, taken off some of the barriers. Uh, and so we have now 
the typical, especially elite American university, the top top end of the system, is just racially diverse. It's more diverse in class terms, as you said, more people with Pell Grants in, 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 the, in the Ivy League and so on. Um, but simply bringing a lot of diverse people together <laughs> Uh, could just produce a world in which they all uh, come to college and simply sort themselves into their various groups and never benefit from or profit from the, uh, the fact of diversity and, and the ways in which diversity could be an educational uh, resource for them. So two questions. One is, um, why is it important for, to, 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 to get people really interacting across difference for the purposes of democracy? Why is it important to our democracy? And second question is, if it isn't happening, how can we make it happen? Well, uh, Anthony, I, I, may, I, I start off in response to the first question with some humility, uh, given this is something which you have written so authoritatively and thoughtfully about uh, for um, much of your academic career. So, um, I'm going to I'm going to take a run at giving the answer that you might have uh, given to me, where I sort of have asked you this question. But look, um, it seems to me we're in a world um, where um, we are seeing increasingly high levels of movement across countries, and not seeing seeing the extent to which, particularly as we see um, being played out quite tragically now. Um, in on uh, the Belarus uh, Poland border, but we're seeing again waves of migrants from, particularly from Africa, but uh, but not only moving to opportunity. And we know that our societies are becoming more multicultural, more multi-ethnic, multi-religious in character. And so, to the extent that our states are becoming less homogeneous, the question is, <laughs> how are we going to how are we going to set up um, or maintain systems of governance and norms that ensure we can resolve our differences without violence and that we can engage in productive enterprise together, collaborative productive enterprise, where uh, uh, we um, set up every citizen for success. And that's, that's, that's the enterprise that I think is, is, is at the core of liberal democracy. And, um, and, and so given that um, we can't resort easily to geographic um, sorting or separation that we're gonna see some level of mixing, at least on a national basis, um, developing the capacity to work across difference, to see the nature of our common humanity, even when we're dealing with people who come from very different belief systems and backgrounds on our own. I think it's just essential for healthy society in a world where our, our populations are just much more diverse. So it's an ideal for supporting the liberal democratic experiment, particularly in a, set, in a setting of, of quite extraordinary and increasing levels of heterogeneity, this seems essential. So having said that pluralism matters, the question is how does the university fit into this story? And in a lot of ways, I think and, uh, universities have been really attentive at one level to the importance of diverse representation, a way I described a moment ago, first woman, then, then racial ethnic minorities, and increasingly thinking about socioeconomic status as another important uh, component of how we define diversity. But what worries me, and I think worries a lot of us who have the privilege of, of leading uh, universities, is to see the extent to which the sorting that we see taking place within, uh, within our country, where people now are living in enclaves, where they are sharing the same belief systems, where they are, um, where they um, have the same socioeconomic status and so forth, um, to the extent that this country is becoming more and more stratified and sorted geographically, to have students that are so diverse, and we have this diverse representation in our institutions, but not get the full bounty of true interactions across those different groups, strikes me as a tremendous, uh, tremendous lost opportunity. And so, um, 
And so I, th- I think it is really important, particularly in a setting where we don't have national service, we don't have, we, we don't have uh, mandatory military or non-military service. And so the, the truth is in this country, we have few places where we have communities that are created that break the enclaves and bring people together. Universities are that. For four years, we have, particularly with this greater sensitivity to uh, to uh, breaking down the barriers that would have impeded access to our institution and seeing this diversity here. The question is, how do you get the benefit of truly vibrant interaction and pluralism and really being able to mix it up so that the students really find themselves in a setting where they're not just congregating, coalescing with people that are just like them. So how do you do it? I think it's, in some cases, it's very simple. Um, the trend that has operated in a number of universities over the last uh, several decades is to move away from the university deciding when students come to live um, as undergraduates on our campuses, whom they live with, to let the students decide whom they live with. And surprise, surprise, when students uh, do that on their own um, in advance of coming to the institution, they tend to find people who look just like them. And so that they, from the get-go, they're in the most intimate settings with shared dorm space with people who are a lot like them instead of actually being forced to confront and figure out how you work constructively with someone who's from a completely different background than your own. And so, um, it, starting off with institutions like Duke, um, but followed by many others, and we followed this year as well, we've decided to put an end to the capacity of students to be able to find, to select their own roommates, and we're going to um, to do those assignments uh, without student input. I think that's important. Um, I think trying to go beyond just simply the living spaces, but how you create many opportunities within the university where students have interaction with others who are different from them is again, something that is really important. We're even thinking about how we design physical spaces so that you increase the level of serendipitous interaction with people who are very different from you. So this is not just an afterthought, but actually constitutes a key part or a key way in which the university vindicates its responsibility to move beyond just uh, representation, diverse representation, and, and really create conditions where people see that they can understand, get along with, explore interactions and, and to understand the nature of differences between themselves and people from wholly different backgrounds than their own. And I think that's such important training for what we need to do in a country that is now so deeply beset by, marred by high levels of of polarization and and acrimony across, particularly across um, uh, political boundaries and lines. So so one of the proposals in your book, which we didn't have time to talk about, has to do with uh, precisely uh, getting people to engage across those political differences in a way that doesn't happen very much uh, in the sort, at least it doesn't happen very much in the sorts of institutions that I've been in. Uh, because what typically happens with, with people who are talking about issues of public policy or public importance in our universities is that a group of people who agree with someone invites her, him or her to talk. And uh, <laughs> Nobody who disagrees, nobody who disagrees with the person. I, comes either up at the event. Comes up the event. Or they're outside, they're not listening to what the person says, they're protesting the fact that there's someone who's got this view on campus. Um, and so no real engagement. And your th- one of your thoughts is that if you're going to have discussions of these sorts of public matters in the university, and as you said, we must, because we're one of the, the, the sites for testing ideas about how to run our society, that's one of our jobs, um, if we're going to do that, you think there's a better way to do it than the way we currently mostly do it? I think I think this is where um, our picking up the mantle uh, of trying to create um, lots of events on campus where, again, you have debates, where you have panel discussions, but you're 
deliberately creating moments where, you're, again, you're going to have a mixing of perspectives, of experiences, and force not just merely people to engage one another, but trying to develop the habits of citizenship. And, and by that, I mean that um, you will be in settings where you learn and see where the differences um, are very palpable, where the differences may be illusory. That is to say, sometimes when we confront each other and debate and work through an issue, and again, in this spirit of common citizenship, we may find that, uh, uh, that what separates us is not different underlying values, but there's different views of, of fact and the empirical state of the world, which maybe we're able to resolve through further work, through, um, through um, you know, additional investigation that maybe we can find ways of narrowing differences. At the same time, even when one sees that what separates us our different values or um, our understandings about what the good life is, that we're still able to see that there's decency, goodwill uh, um, on the part of, of, of others in a way that prevents what we see far too often in American society today is a real demonization of the other. And where you know, increasingly we're seeing across party lines that we just we don't even view the other as wrong. We, we regard them as morally culpable, as, as being motivated by ill will. Um, and again, I think that moving to more interaction, more debate, more discussion, that it's not just speaking to the individuals who have a particular interest in hearing this worldview, I think just better prepares our students for the the realities of citizenship in a much more complicated world than we've uh, we've we've seen in a long time, um, and where we really do have to grapple very directly with this multicultural, multi-ethnic fabric that you've written so eloquently about. So uh, I'm going to ask you one one last question, which sort of covers all. That. You've made a lot of interesting proposals uh, in the book. Uh, uh, about purposeful pluralism, about access, uh, about um, creating more contexts in which you get real discussion and debate rather than simply two lots of people shouting in different corners of the room. Um, I wonder if there isn't an underlying challenge here, which is just that the more you think of students and their parents as kind of consumers of a product, the harder it's going to be <laughs> to make the changes that they may not like in order that your institution can do the thing that you think it's supposed to do. Uh, and in order that it can be uh, really serving a democracy in the ways that you argue for. And I'm wondering what you think about that. And isn't part of that a, 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 a problem that arises because of something that we haven't talked about, which is how expensive uh, universities have uh, have become. It's true that we have lots more money than we did in the past for people who don't have don't have money, but um, they're still very expensive. And and so it's natural if you've got a very expensive, dare I say, product, uh, to think of your of the people who are going to have to pay the costs, which is, you know, taxpayers if you're a public system as well uh, as um, uh, as as parents and students um, as kind of people that you have to cater to. How do you how do you as how do you um, make sure that you can do all these things faced with this kind of consumerist uh, attitude, I think on the part of many families to, to, to education, to tertiary education? So I, I think um, it starts first and foremost with going back to core mission. Um, we're not, we're, I, I don't like to see ourselves as in a business I don't like to see ourselves as service providers or widget manufacturers. We're doing something very noble and education is a noble enterprise. And I think when we admit students into our institution, we can't lose sight of the fact that 
um, whatever the market pressures are, and I th and they are there, but I think you can, by being true to your core sense of what you're doing as educators, I think you can persuade people that, um, that when we make decisions where we actually draw lines in the sand and say, we are going to, at this institution, say you don't get to choose a roommate, or at this institution, we think it's really essential that our students have exposure to the found a course in the foundations of American democracy and the ideas that animated it and where the enterprise has succeeded and where it hasn't. I think ultimately um, people will understand the worthiness of that enterprise. And I don't think that that will deter them in any way. I don't, I don't, I really don't think that, um, this kind of market thinking should be allowed to permeate what we see as essential to our um, enterprise and to our responsibilities as educators. And indeed, you know, just every trend for so many um, institutions, public and private, that are um, involved in this wonderful marriage of research and teaching but what we have seen um, is incredible demand for this experience. And so with that, I think we should be confident in saying that in part what people are understanding is that there is something truly spectacular, um, magical, profoundly transformative that it takes place at these institutions that goes well beyond sort of rank credentialism. There's, there's a learning experience that takes place here and that we owe our students a responsibility to do our best to give them an experience that is commensurate with that obligation. And if that means in some places saying that this is, this is a course, this is an experience, or this is a practice that we believe is principle, it's important for your growth um, as individuals and as, as young citizens, I think it's important that we hold the line. Well, you've persuaded me, so <laughs> it seems like a moment uh, uh, with that uh, argument uh, to that all of the things that you're arguing for can be done, uh, can, can be persuasively defended so that uh, people understand why we're doing them. Uh, with that argument, I'm going to thank you very much for uh, joining us here at the New York Public Library. Both, uh, It's been fun for me to talk to you. I also... Since I'm a trustee of the library, would like to thank you on behalf of the library itself. Thank you so much, Anthony, for a great discussion. And uh, and and uh, again, it's it's a real privilege to uh, be able to talk with someone who's written so authoritatively on so many uh, of the subjects that trench on the book. And so, thank you for your time as well. Well, it was terrific. I, I enjoyed it very much. And uh, and thank you all for listening. Thank you for joining us. For more information and to register for upcoming programs, visit nypl.org live.